if I remember correctly, there's some like 42 nutrients that are known to be essential. You know, when we're talking about amino acids, uh, lipids, vitamins, minerals. And so copper is one of the key ones. It's, it's one of the essential trace minerals. Um, and when you look at the, what copper does, um, it's important in skeletal formation. It's important in a number of enzymes. It's a cofactor in a number of reactions. So welcome to the Pet Food Science Podcast. We're going to talk about an exciting area of copper uh, nutrition in pets today. And I have an expert with me, Karen Wiedekin, Dr. Karen Wiedekin. I've had the privilege of working together uh, and then we followed our careers in separate places. But I'm very pleased to have this time to, to chat with you today, Dr. Wiedekin. Um, so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got you know, to the position you are today in pet food science. Thank you, Dennis, for uh, inviting me to do this podcast. Um, I completed my PhD work at the University of Illinois under the direction of David Baker. Um, for those of you that may not be aware, Dr. Baker is a was a world-renowned scientist. He did a lot of bioavailability research in poultry, swine, and companion animals in the area of amino acids, vitamins, and trace minerals. And I think it's really important, bioavailability, especially um, for this topic that we're talking about today. We know, for example, in the case of copper, there are publications showing that absorption of copper is only 10% in pet foods or certain pet foods. And then I also was a co-author on a study where we looked at bioavailability of key pet food ingredients and we saw bioavailability as low as zero for some ingredients and, and to numbers that were over 100%. So it's just, and then if you think about how diverse pet foods are, I mean, we have canned, semi-moist, dry diet, and all the protein sources, all the ingredients, they're just so, there's such a diversity and it really makes it difficult then to come up with a recommendation um, that's going to be appropriate for all the different scenarios that we're talking about that exist in the gamut of, of pet food. And so I think that, you know, having the background in bioavailability is really important, especially when you're studying trace minerals. And also I want to point out, um, even, you know, looking at other species, sometimes there's a lot more work and knowledge that's been published in humans or in livestock that has application to dogs and cats and that's important as well so having that comparative nutrition background that i have i think also helps with the expertise around studying of trace minerals if i could sum my career in, in five words i would say trace minerals and multi-species expertise and so like if you look at my research records i've published in poultry swine dogs cats equine and rats and then if you look at the publications, uh, looking at both book chapters, peer-reviewed publications, and patents, I have over 80 publications. So hopefully that background I can will convince you that I have expertise in this area. And the last thing I want to say is um, in 2021, Sharon Center published an article in the JAVMA Journal, A Viewpoint, entitled, Is It Time to Reconsider Current Guidelines for Copper Content in Commercial Pet Foods? And I really want to take some of the time of this podcast to address some of the, the evidence that was presented and then just address some of, uh, or rebut some of her comments. So hopefully we'll have a chance today to, to, to do that. Corbion's Aldeprine, DHA P3, the algae-based omega-3 DHA to boost brain, cognition, immune system, and well-being. Adding it to pet food is easier than ever. Cut out the middle fish and go straight to the natural source to enjoy all the benefits of omega-3 DHA. It's better for the planet with zero impact on the ocean and low carbon footprint, and it's easy to use. The highly concentrated biomass powder is suitable for multiple applications. Learn more at corbion.com. No, we absolutely do. But I wonder if we could start a little bit farther back, Dr. Wiedekind, because thank you for your background. It's extensive. And of course, many people have seen this uh, 
this podcast won't have heard it as, as I know it to be true. So absolutely, you're an expert in this field. The thing I wonder if you could start just a little bit about why we might know copper is important because sort of peculiarly, some research has reported or people have stated, well, I don't really need copper in food. But can you just tell us what what biologically drives that need for copper? Um, that is a really good question. I'm glad you're asking that. I mean, um, if, if I remember correctly, there's some like 42 nutrients that are known to be essential. You know, when we're talking about amino acids, uh, lipids, vitamins, minerals. And so copper is one of the key ones. It's it's one of the essential trace minerals. Um, and when you look at the what copper does, um, it's important in skeletal formation. It's important in a number of enzymes. It's a cofactor in a number of reactions. Um, one of the, the deficiency symptoms that we saw in pets that was a, due to copper deficiency was low hematocrit and low hemoglobin. So some people not, may not realize that copper is involved in the metabolism of a hemoglobin. So if copper is deficient, you're not going to be able to synthesize hemoglobin appropriately. And I know I'm missing some of the like other essential things that copper does, um, but hopefully I've addressed a number of them enough to know that you do not want to be feeding an animal a copper deficient diet. Well, it's interesting thing, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot and maybe maybe someday we'll do a retrospective outside of copper and just the nutrition conversations you and I have had because I think they would be interesting. But regarding copper, um, you know, it is heme and, and, and so you've got hematocrit and, and the blood values. But one of the things I know you and I have both talked about in the past is the skin and coat that one of the one of the things people may not realize is right. that if you don't have copper and adequate uh, uh, intake and adequate, and it's really one of the reasons why, you know, as, as you and I have made pet foods in the past, we keep copper uh, sources in there because it's pretty apparent when it's not there in the population that some percentage of that population uh, develops a poor skin and coat. Is that... Is that kind of what you remember too, or what you're thinking? No, no. Thanks for reminding me. Like gray hair, like a, a dog or a cat that has black hair, if they're fed a copper deficient diet, it can change to gray. So the pigmentation is affected. Also, uh, especially in if you feed copper deficient diet to in reproduction or gestation lactation, the kittens or the puppies that were born can have like kinked tails and uh, the coat texture is altered. So the, the texture, the color, and then also, like I said, the, even the, um, the strength or whatever of the fibers, like in sheep, it's known that the, the wool will look different. Um, it's true for across a number of different animals that, that the hair coat's gonna be affected. Yeah. You know, we, you brought up the sheep. Sheep are really sensitive to copper and copper toxicity. And, and to a certain degree, there's there's some genotypes in, especially in dog, that seem to kind of act like sheep, where you know, you just don't want copper in there. Can can you talk about the the metabolism of copper storage and copper transmission yes. that kind of says, wow, this is complicated. This is not it's not simple. Right, that's a very good lead-in question. I mean, some of the information that I was researching and trying to you know, come up with answers or whatever around this issue, it does look like sheep might be a really good example, it has a lot of similarities to these dog breeds that have this copper genetic defect. So what we know about that defect is, is that they're not able to excrete copper. And if you look at ruminants, this is true for both cattle and for sheep, they really cannot regulate copper excretion. So if you just look at copper concentrations in liver, much higher in sheep liver and beef liver than it is in pork liver or turkey liver, for example. Um, and that's because copper excretion is not regulated in ruminants and it's there's a defect that prevents it from being regulated in these dogs with this copper genetic defect. So as you increase copper intake, it's a 
liver copper is a linear function of copper intake in those animals. And that is not true for normal healthy dogs because in a normal healthy animal, like in monogastrics, they show, if you look at liver copper as a function of copper intake, there's actually a flat line because that excretion is, is, uh, does work in normal healthy animals. Both absorption and excretion are regulated. So it's kind of like a thermostat in a house that can regulate heat. So it adjusts air conditioning and heat to keep that temperature at a constant. The same thing happens in, in liver copper. It's totally maintained at appropriate concentrations, very consistent level. You do not see an increase in liver copper until you get above concentrations of 150. That's been shown in swine, that's been shown in rats, and that's been shown in poultry. So, if you know, I, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a titration copper study done in dogs, but you would expect in dogs and cats that they would perform similarly to these other monogastric sheep, poultry, and swine. Yeah. So, 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 you know what I mean. So then, and then, if you look at like, there's been publications by uh, AFCO. Like feed control officials, like each state has has done copper analysis, so they know they they've done over like 1,500 around 1,500 um, dog food samples analyzed for copper, and we know like average copper concentrations in in adult diets is around 20 ppm. In all life stage diets, the average was 30 ppm. So that 20 and 30 ppm average is well below that threshold of 150. So it should be in uh, in that plateau region where liver coppers are, are maintained. And um, even if you look at this, like upper limits of uh, the highest coppers that were reported in, the, in that 1500 sample analysis, there were only three diets that were like over 100. And if you look at publications that show ranges, you know, in dog foods, they show the highest as being 50. So again, even when you take the extreme, we're still below that 150 threshold. Now it's obviously it would be better if we had data in dogs that would confirm, you know, where, what is the upper limit where, you know, at some point we see that spike in liver copper concentrations. I mean, that's kind of some of the fundamental work that needs to be done. And I wish, you know, I would like, there, there, there is like dollars to support some of the. Well, there's et ethical issues. Yes, that's true. Ethical issues too, aren't there? Yeah, and in the sense that it's hard to do those liver biopsies, and it's pretty invasive. Right, easy to do it in chickens, right? But not so easy. Yeah, it's a different an animal you're going to, going to slaughter for consumption versus a pet. True. Um. So, the thing that that I wonder if we could talk about, and I do want to get into your. Your your in depth discussion of of this article that was it was a viewpoint, um, but I think it reflected a, a viewpoint of a number of very strong opinions in this area. But before that, let's talk and you know just it's just talking around the edges. But but clearly some pets some dogs have a need for a low copper food because they have these this genetic excuse me genetic predisposition to copper storage problems. And 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 even cause harm, right? That that there's there's true pets that are harmed by by uh, excess copper. Right. How do we how do we how do we handle that as an industry? What what do you think? You know, there, there's there's a true problem and a true need, and and you come out with this this troubling kind of. Mm, what do we do? As far as I know, there have been uh, developed for. For these dogs with this genetic defect, there is a therapeutic diet that is low in copper. And before I talk about that, there's been research that's been shown that in dogs with this genetic defect, copper balance is achieved at a level of only 3 ppm. So that is extremely low copper level. So you have to have, you know, a specially formulated diet to be able to hit that low number. And and if that level of low copper is exceeded, then then these dogs with this genetic defect have issues. And the problem, of course, with with my perspective is that three parts per million, and and you and I both fed foods, 
with the available copper and some that somewhere down in that level. Yeah. That is not a sufficient diet for most dogs. No, it's not. Dogs have trouble if they're normal at that level. Exactly. That's the tension we have. Right. Which is why dogs with genetic defects should not be fed commercial diets because the level of copper that's needed in normal, healthy animals that can regulate copper is much higher, much higher than that 3 ppm. So if you were to feed, it, it, it doesn't make sense for the industry to formulate diets at a low level that would be appropriate for these dogs with this genetic defect. They need to be fed a, low, a therapeutic diet and under the supervision of the veterinarian because there's even research done. There was a study done by Feeton in 2015, I think, and others. They showed that, and these were studies done with dogs known to have these defects. They fed a low copper diet. The level of copper in that diet was five. And they said 50% of those dogs fed that low copper diet. That was not, that did not appropriately address this issue of copper liver accumulation in, in these dogs. They had, so what, ha, what they showed was that adjunctive therapy, this is why it need, they need to be fed under supervision of vets. They need to also be fed, in addition to the low copper diet, like a copper chelating agent such as penicillamine or tetrathiomolybdate. So a chelating agent that helps um, even further lower the liver copper. So, you know, if 50% of it, even that low copper diet is may not be enough nice. alone. And then and you especially don't want to be feeding that to a normal healthy dog. Yeah. So, so the, the so the, and then just to point out, like, this is a common thing. Like, there's a whole line of therapeutic diets developed um, for a number of disorders and diseases. So, like, renal disease. We know that dogs with renal disease need low phosphorus, low protein. They should not be fed a commercial diet. The same thing as dogs with food allergies. They need to be a novel protein or a hydrolysate diet. Again, not a normal commercial diet. So, it's like feeding this low copper therapeutic diet, which again has been around since the 90s, has been shown to be effective, but in some instances, additional, you know, therapy is needed on top of that low copper diet. So, so that's the answer. The answer is that we've got two different populations. If you do like the Zen diagram, there's no overlap. They need to be separate. Yeah. They, they shouldn't, you know, the one should not be fed the other. So two things I, I thought I really liked, Karen, and I'd like to sort of maybe just reinforce it or discuss it, that in fact, this isn't so unique to copper. Right. In fact, optimum nutrition often defines, especially for animals that, that are not healthy, often defines a very different food. And, and, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. I mean, there's metabolic defects uh, in, in all of us, as well as our pets. Yes. And, um, you know, you got to find that optimum nutrition. It, it can be tragic, right? If you've missed it, right? not just in this food, but in many foods, if you have a, a food allergy and you don't know that, and your you or your pet are sick because of this food allergy, you may not even know it's a food allergy, right? You you uh, you observe these symptoms, you don't have a solution. You have a solution, you you can you can uh, be successful. Unfortunately, with copper, if you don't know that, right, and that that animal can have you know, even, even death as a result of that uh, inappropriate understanding of what their true nutrition needs. And I think that's why this, this uh, area has so much uh, power in it, so much emotion in it, because if we get it wrong with an individual pet, really bad things happen. And I was just going to say that, that that copper storage disease is a lethal disease. And so if they're being fed inappropriately, then they're going to have a short lifespan and that's really sad and and and, and I understand that but it, but I do want to yeah. add something to the, your comment at least today there's nine breeds that are known to have the copper genetic defect so if you are an owner of a dog that is one of those breeds I mean I would assume right away and I think that they can do probably genetic tests to confirm you know does my dog have this defect and I and um, so let me just identify what those breeds are for those that aren't aware. The first breeds that were ever identified were Bedling Bedlington Terriers, 
Um, other ones are West Highland White Terriers, Doberman Pinschers, Cocker Spaniels, Sky Terriers, Dalmatians, Labrador Retrievers. And there was a study that was just recent, like a couple years ago, where they identified two new breeds, Corgis and Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And then I also need to point out that if you have a crossbred dog, a mixed breed, if they have, you know, part of their genetics is one of those nine breeds, then, you know, then there, there may be a possibility that they, a crossbred dog would have that defect. Yeah. So that's very, very serious and concerning, I think, for all pet owners and people really care about this concern. Um, fortunately, there are some tests available, right, that we can we can go out and chase that. Well, maybe it's a good a good transition to this article. You 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 obviously had a had a lot of uh, a lot of things to say about it. Um, clearly, you're you're not agreeing with the conclusions that were presented. So let's let's walk through that and okay. and take take a little time now, if you would, and just tell us maybe what your concerns were, you know, in that fashion you were talking about. Let's just talk about two of the concerns today, because I don't know if there's enough time to talk about all of them. Um, but my biggest concern is, is that the data that was presented were like liver biopsies or necropsy samples. So there were samples taken from a disease population. And none of the studies that were presented in that paper had normal healthy controls. And so, like, right away, that's a flaw because, you know, as a nutritionist, and we've had lots of statistics, it's everyone knows that it's important to have controls in your in a well-designed study so that you know, you know, you have a reference to compare to. And it's not appropriate to take samples from a disease population and extrapolate that to normal healthy um, because it may not be applicable. And like we've already talked about, we we know in those breeds that have the defect that copper excretion is not controlled. And so they're going to see higher liver concentrations because they can't excrete the copper. But in normal healthy animal that has uh, both absorption and excretion under control, you wouldn't expect to see this liver accumulation unless you get a, extremely high in levels. and there's been data published by AFCO that we know, you know, the, the the concentrations that exist in pet foods are well below that threshold. So, um, so so that's one of the flaws is that they didn't have normal healthy controls, you know, to compare to. Or, you know, like I said, there's never been, to my knowledge, titration studies done in a normal healthy population. And to your point. You know that there, those are invasive measurements, so it's it's no surprise maybe that 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 study hasn't been done. The other second criticism that I had was, in none of those studies where they show the liver copper concentrations again in the disease populations, but they're saying that the pet food they're implying that pet food level copper levels are inappropriate, but they didn't capture any dietary information in those trials. You don't know the manufacturer. You don't know, you know, what the ingredients were in the diet. They didn't measure copper. So, like, there may not have been a correlation or association uh, or a link between dietary copper and and the severity of the pathology or the liver copper concentrations. How can you make that uh, statement that, that it's high copper is the cause? I mean, intuitively and hypothetically, it would make sense. But you, until you do the actual study, there may not be a correlation between diet copper and the level of liver copper. There may be some other like interacting factor that m plays more of a driver than than copper per se. Yeah, those are very critical points. The, th the thing I keep coming back to is we have this knowledge that with this genetic defect, there is a copper storage problem. We have a tremendous group of animals that people have known a lot about in sheep with copper storage problems that that have that have this, you know, sheep die with copper. I mean, it's just it's just lethal if they get too much copper. It, it, it's a tremendous problem. And as you know, even in pets, it's a problem in such a way. 
I, I keep I keep struggling with how could we possibly think that what would be good for a healthy optimum would be good for this you know significantly different genetic uh, handling of copper. It, it it seems intuitively to to just like you said those those two populations actually don't overlap. What's what's right. one best versus another best? And, and I, I keep, I, I can't, I can't get rid of that feeling. I, I, I think you're reflecting it too. I, I don't know any other possible option. And I just to like uh, further add to that, that point, and I'm totally in agreement with you on this. They, they, when I was reading like, inf- like copper information in sheep, they, they kind of came to similar conclusions. Like they, they gave examples and the same thing is probably true for pets, but slightly different. Like you can, let's just say, um, that the copper concentration of a diet is 10 ppm, because this is the example that was given. In one scenario, TPM, 10 ppm is totally appropriate, um, because like depending on the you know like where in the United States the sheep are grown, there are, are antagonistic factors um, that can greatly reduce copper. So like if molybdenum is high, if sulfur is high then that 10 ppm may be like very poorly available and it could be deficient. But then in another scenario where there's no antagonistic factors, that 10 ppm is, is appropriate. I mean, we're kind of, t- the same thing could happen like in pet foods. That's why it's so hard. And they even said it like why, you know, it's so difficult to come up with one number because that one number could be toxic in some certain situations, but then deficient in the other. And, and, and we have those, uh, scenarios in pet foods like what's the level of fiber in the diet what's the level of calcium and phosphorus all of those things are known to reduce it and if and we know there there are a lot of diets out there that have calcium and phosphorus that are two or three x of what the requirement is so those diets probably need a lot more copper than a diet where the calcium and phosphorus is right at AFCO recommendations that's just one example but you know and then like um Amino acids, proteins, the, they talk about the, those can influence copper absorption. I remember the book chapter I read of yours, Dr. Wiedekin, where you had that that molecules interacting with each other and that, that sort of diagram of so many interactive capacities. Yeah. And as nutritionists, we need to kind of pull them together, right? So, so I'm kind of a minimalist. You know, I'm not overfeeding copper. I'm not overfeeding calcium. I'm not overfeeding phosphorus. I feel like I know where that, you know, that box all fits together. But if somebody comes in and they say, well, it's, it's 2% calcium and 1% phosphorus. I mean, I I couldn't even begin to tell you how much copper you should put in that food. I don't know. That's exactly the the dilemma and the, and you know, the complexity and the difficulty of of trace minerals. Like I said, the, the, the bioavailability can be so variable and so low and and you definitely want to err on you need to apply a bioavailability factor or safety margin that kind of addresses all of these antagonisms that may potentially existent because it's easier to probably if you add you know let's just say a little bit of an, a surplus there's no harm in that and so you're better off adding this margin of safety then to try to be too conservative and be, you know, okay, we determine most of those requirement studies are done in purified or, you know, semi-purified diets. And it has to be a, a, a kind of an odd diet because in a commercial diet, you know, at least on paper, then, you know, you're going to surpass what the requirement is. And if you're doing these titrations to try to define the break point, you know, people get criticized. I've seen it. Like, why are they using this odd diet to do this requirement? It's like, well, you have to come up with a diet that's below the requirement, be able to do the titration to delineate what that requirement is. And, but then you, then that number needs to have a a factor applied to it so that it's then has applicability to the commercial diet. And that's where the, the issue is because, well, which commercial diet are you referring to? Because, you know, there's so many factors that can impact it. So you need that, that safety margin is critical. And that's a dilemma that we have from the regulatory perspective, right? So someone comes in and says, I want this regulatory upper limit. 
and because uh, our, our, even when we do minimums, I mean, we do the same thing. We, we try and put a factor in with knowledge that we have, and we know a lot more about minimums, e- even, even in just the normal sense. We do. Um, than, than those optimum maximum. That's the biggest void or gap, in my opinion, is, is actually to, to do the titration at the high end. Like where, where do we see, um, what are the, what's the safe upper limit? And, you know, because, because of this, you know, that diagram that you just talked about where all these interactions are, um, it's reality. And, and so when you're too high, you automatically be, then those interactions that are known, the ones that are interacting with, then the, their utilization is being decreased. Yeah. And so you, you balance is so important, nutritional balance and, 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 um, you don't want deficiencies and you don't want excesses. And then, then it's to try to take all of those factors into account. It can be difficult. So what, what do you, what do you think the goal forward is? How can we, how can we help the, the, you know, maybe a consumer looking at this video, or even if you were to suggest for, for the, you know, I think there maybe will be more, I know there's, there's demand for a regulatory oversight what would you recommend uh, happen as we look you know look at this problem say there's a real problem how do we go forward to my knowledge no nutritionist or scientist has has submitted a rebuttal to that JAFMA paper and i think that you know it's really obvious when you look at the you know, AFCO has had several open forums and pulled in information from consumers and scientists and veterinarians. And um, it's it's obvious that consumers are confused. Like there was a survey that was done as a result of all this debate that's happened as a result of this viewpoint that was published. And consumers actually believe that zero copper is you know, the most appropriate level needed because because the vets kept saying well, we need controlled copper. And so now they're thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't want to be high. I want to be low. I'm like, no, you don't want to be low. You only want to be low if you're if you are an owner of a pet that has that defect. And those dogs should not be fed a commercial diet. They need to be fed this low copper therapeutic diet and they need to be under the supervision of the vet if adjunctive therapy is also required. So. um. So I think, you know, so I think if we could just get the, you know, a rebuttal out there to, for them to understand, okay, like you just asked me in one of the first questions, well, what does copper do? I mean, why do we care if it's adequate or not? You know, what are the consequences if it's deficient? I think they need to understand that. One of the things in that viewpoint was they thought they were um, unhappy about that the copper concentrations aren't revealed on the label. But I, hopefully I gave you that scenario, that example where, where like if, if you have two different diets and they can both have the same concentration, but because of the ingredients that are in that diet, in one diet, that diet's deficient because there's antagonists and the copper's not available. And in the other diet, it's totally appropriate. Does it help the consumer to know that it's, let's say it's 15 ppm copper? It doesn't tell them anything because you don't know based on that one number is that a, is that going to meet the requirement or is that going to be deficient? So hopefully the nutritionists that are knowledgeable about all these things have built in a margin of safety. They have a level that is not only meets the re- minimum requirement, but also is not excessive. You know, it's in that safe zone. It's always our goal. I think in this area, it's a little more sensitive, right? So we can underfeed protein and 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 overfeed protein, and I believe that there's an optimum protein concentration you can do either. Um, but the pets don't tend to get so 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 much in trouble as right. as for that population with copper. And so I I I wonder how the how how the go forward is. I you know I think there might be a a long term solution and selection of of pets that are are uh, are being chosen for for progeny but you know that's not easy either right i'm glad you bring this up because they said in the case of the huntington terriers the one the breed the bedlington terriers sorry the ones that were first identified they said that in that breed 
the issue of copper. You copper know, storage uh, disease, yeah. Yeah, so the, the basically through breeding, I guess, you know, they've identified the carriers of the defect and they found ones, males that weren't carriers. And and, and it's like the problem is, is much less prevalent than it, what it used to be. I wouldn't say that it's eliminated, but what I read was, I well, this is really encouraging. So obviously, you know, there, you know, probably more work needs to be done with geneticists and nutrition. You know what I mean? Like uh, these other breeds, they, if they can identify the carriers, I mean, that I think that would go a long ways. Yeah, it's, it's a hard, hard solution. And obviously when you have a pet, it's not the solution for your pet, but it's as we look right. at the future and think what might be done, I think, you know, like that particular breed you're describing sounds like they've been quite successful at really understanding the problem and enhancing, you know, the long-term health of the breed, if you will, yes. by, by that selection. I don't know about the genotyping. If you, if you just, is, do you know, Dr. Wiedekind, I don't, if you, if you go out and say, I'm nice to I thought that it was really interesting when I saw that article. And that's all I can tell you is that, that there's a lot of progress that have been made in that one breed. And I don't, I, I, what I, what I have read is like, well, like Labrador retrievers, that's a very common breed. Um, it does look yeah. like that, that genetic defect that was identified in the first studies in the Bedlington Terrors, it's different. It, like it's not an, an identical defect. I thought, well, how is it different? I don't know that. Um, but, you know, so a lot of people that have expertise in that area, hopefully, you know, can shed some light on that. A longer, healthier lifespan for our pets. That is EW Nutrition's target. With immunoglobulins, that target is within reach. IGY are a young generation technology platform an innovative solution that has been tried and tested over the last decades and can now yield tangible benefits. Immunoglobulins from egg yolk improve the animal's response to pathogens in the gut or in the mouth. They're easy to administer, they're perfectly safe, and they just work. Made with passion, proven with science. Well, that sounds good. If you look at the, at the general, the micronutrient area that you've been uh, so much of your career in, um, is copper the big one or are we actually just isolating it for this conversation? Should we really be talking about zinc or selenium or molybdenum or you know, whatever else might come to mind as a micronutrient? To me, and this may be oversimplifying, I think the solution for copper is the, you know, that those dog breeds that are known to have the defect are fed the therapeutic diet and that, you know, we don't try to change the copper regular in the normal healthy population there's 200 breeds that have been identified and so it's like it doesn't make sense to, to modify the commercial diets to satisfy 100 percent of all breeds when there's a you know genetic defect in place but in the case of like this safe upper limits the vets were asking for that i think that that is I think there needs to be more research in all of the minerals to finding what those safe upper limits are. It's actually what's surprising for copper. It probably has the narrowest range between what's known to be required and the levels that are in pet food. They're really, it's a fairly small range. If you contrast that with calcium and phosphorus and some of the other trace minerals, that could be 10 or 20 times different. There need to be some regulations on some of those. You, if we're dealing with zinc, you know, at some level, if you don't have enough zinc, the pet doesn't grow. It's a bad thing. But you can have pretty adequate levels of zinc and you got a margin of safety that's... Yeah, there's... Now, selenium might be pretty tight. <laughs> because, uh, let me just give you an example. In the case of selenium and iodine, seafood is known to be high in selenium and iodine. So if you're feeding a diet that's 100%, like seafood or tuna or whatever... Those diets are extremely high in selenium and iodine. And, you know, based on human research, because there's been a lot of work done, you know, on thyroid function and, and what happens when you're at extremes, excessive and deficient. So, I mean, it's known that 10x of the requirement ca can cause dysfunction. And, and some of those diets that are 100% seafood or whatever, you're at levels more than 10x of the requirement. And so, in my opinion, yeah. there needs to be safe upper limits. So, I mean, I do, I think that, the, you know, some of this fundamental, more fundamental research needs to be done to define safe upper limits so that we have nutritional balance. We talked about balance, how important that is. 
Um, protein, it starts with protein because with protein comes minerals. And so some of these diets that are like super high in protein, they're going to also be high in a lot of these minerals. And I think it's just like, there's just like a domino effect. You know, you, if one nu nutrient's super high, then uh, others come with it. And then it, it, it can cause issues. Well, Dr. Wittigan, thank you for your insight and understanding. We'll have to watch this and see see how it uh, proceeds in the industry and, and with the research that you've outlined, it sure would be, would be great to have more information um, and information of, of studies designed and controlled. Um, you know, the, the epidemiology is always fascinating, um, but causation and correlation are always, always in question. And like you said, sometimes even some of the axes are not filled in. So that makes that question even more difficult. Yeah. So I, I think maybe we, we've kind of discussed this. Anything else you want to tell us? No, I think, I think, uh, at least, you know, several of the, the big issues that I wanted to address, I think we covered today and I, I really appreciate the invitation to talk about this topic. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing your expertise to, to this podcast and for telling us your perspective and, and giving us some ideas on, on you know, what the background was and how it all fits together. So I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Me too.